Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Read Fuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 13th of September 2021. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So before I get into all the stuff that happened over the weekend, I do want to give a quick reminder here that uh, Gitcoin Grants Matching Round is still on. So if you haven't done your donations yet, be sure to do so. Uh, it goes until September 22nd. So you do have a bit of time here, but don't delay. Don't forget, you know, do it after you finish listening to the refuel, or maybe pause the refuel and go do it now so you don't forget. I'll be giving you periodic reminders up until September 22nd anyway, uh, but better to do it sooner rather than later. But <laughs> it's funny, in saying that I haven't done my donations yet, but we won't talk about that. Uh, I'll be doing mine soon, but just make sure you know you get it done before the deadline here so that that $950,000 worth of matching funds goes to you know not only the projects that other people want to see funded, but the projects that you want to see funded as well. All right, so I think the biggest piece of news activity, you know, I guess what everyone was talking about over the weekend was Arbitrum. Now, we all know that Arbitrum 1, the Arbitrum 1 mainnet went live about 12 or 13 days ago now uh, after I had been talking about it for many, many months and really we had, it had been teased for many, many months. But essentially... The reason why it was talked about was because their growth absolutely exploded across like TVL, uh, number of unique addresses, transactions, fee revenue. It's just absolutely insane. And you can see here that their TVL went to $2.2 billion. And really the majority of this growth, hap growth happened within the last few days. Uh, and it was because, of, I mean, a few different reasons, right? Like one of the biggest reasons was there was some uh, massive kind of yield farms that got spun up, something called like Nyan Farm or something, some cat farm and a couple of other ones out there. The ones that we've seen on um, Ethereum's Layer 1 before. Uh, we've all seen it right we're, we're, during DeFi summer and, and, and stuff like that as well. So, you know, hundreds of thousands of ETH got bridged into it and we, we had this TVL spike up to over $2 billion, which, which is absolutely insane. And over uh, and about seven hundred million dollars was deposited in just one day. So this growth has been phenomenal for Arbitrum, and I'm I'm really happy to see them kind of seeing the success so far. They hit their like mainnet transaction limits that they have in place, like their training wheels, which is hilarious. They had I think seventy thousand unique addresses so far uh, use the use the network, which is which is pretty good um, considering they've only been alive for not even two weeks so far. Uh, the fees that they're generating is actually quite amazing. If I go to here and, and look at their fees, CryptoFees.info has been updated to show their fear revenue now you can see over the last 24 hours they did $168,000 worth of fear revenue um and optimism is actually doing double that as well so there's been some on flow as well like optimism got a bit of growth too i think people are realizing that, they, that these layer two networks are now live because of arbitrum and they're checking out optimism they're checking out all the other ones like dydx as well seems to be growing too i mean i've personally been using dydx more recently uh, for a few different reasons but it's so quick it's so amazing like i just these layer twos are awesome and people are just like sleeping on them still. Um, but, uh, you know, I think Arbitrum is now like, uh, I guess, ahead of Optimism's growth here in terms of TVL and stuff like that. But in terms of fear of new Optimism still making more. And Uniswap on Arbitrum did over $30 million of volume last time I checked over the weekend uh, on, on either Saturday or Sunday. And Optimism has done... I think $15 million or something, which is a record for both the networks, which is just absolutely crazy. Just a lot of activity going on. And there was this thread put out here from Jin covering uh, a bunch of kind of, I guess, the Arbitrum metrics and stuff like that and how you can get involved with Arbitrum, how you can bridge, how long it takes, what block explorers to use, um, you know, how to how to chart different things and all that sort of stuff. So definitely check out this thread. It'll be linked in the YouTube description. Um, but I mean, it's just been amazing, right? To see this, to see this growth of Arbitrum. And some people have criticized it or kind of try to diminish this growth saying oh it all it, it all just went there because it went into like this ponzi farm or whatever you want to call it and i kind of um, pu push back on that and I, I wrote some stuff about this in the newsletter today but i push back on that because what people are just moralizing now about what's a good project what versus what's a bad project i mean so what like i, I don't understand where this logic is coming from uh all the liquidity mining programs on uh the quote-unquote legit DeFi apps were exactly the same they were paying out token rewards as you yield, right, as they called them, in order to provide liquidity. They had, Some of them had pool, uh, pool two, some of them didn't, which is, I guess, the more kind of like... Um hardcore pool where there's much higher chance of kind of like losing your money in but you know some of them had that and you know I, I don't i don't really see the fundamental difference here like to be honest but in terms of like liquidity mining programs and some people may, may say okay well it's more legit because there's this actual product behind it and then there's liquidity mining on top and yes fine that's fair but the principle still remains the same the whole point of liquidity mining is to attract liquidity so not only has uh th those kind of like i guess you can call them ponzi farms whatever you want to call them uh, i'm just 
just going to call them yield farms on Arbitrum attracted liquidity, but it's also has it having an onflow effect into the rest of the ecosystem that's on Arbitrum. Like I just mentioned, Uniswap's volumes are, are on Arbitrum are, are exploding. SushiSwap also uh, did a lot of volume on there as well. I don't know the number off the top of my head, but they did. Balances on there. There's a few other stuff, a uh, th few other things on there, and there are going to be more and more apps coming. So these people are already being onboarded. They just came through like this yield farm or this Ponzi farm, or whatever. And it doesn't matter. They're they're on Arbitrum. They're using it. They're experiencing the lower fees. They're adding to the network's kind of fundamental value here. And they're actually, um, you know, it's actually real activity. So there is no point like moralizing here and saying, well, uh, I guess like uh, it was just to that Ponzi farm. It's just going to go away as quickly as it came. It may, but it may not. It may, a lot of people may stay there because they're like, well, why would I go back to layer one when all when all the, I know that all these apps are coming? Uh, I can do it cheaper on layer two. So I'm just going to stay here. So it works as just a, a really great way to bootstrap a new ecosystem and, a boot, and, and a fr basically free marketing, which I think is really, really cool. So I, I don't really like the fact that people are trying to moralize this sort of stuff and saying what's good or bad. Um, but I guess on that note about fees and cost savings, Chainlink God had a really great tweet thread here, basically the correcting the misconception that uh, the transaction speed limit on Arbitrum is capping the cost savings, um, but Arbitrum isn't running at capacity yet, as I've described before. Uh, the, the costs are derived, and I explained this on one of last week's refuels, but the costs of um, layer two Two fees are derived from uh, the L1 security, the L1 kind of um, call data that needs to be posted. Uh, sorry, the, the call data that needs to be posted to L1. That is kind of like a fixed fee. And I mean, the Arbitrum guys went over this on the Bankless podcast. You, sh you should go check out the podcast that they did there for a full breakdown of this. But essentially, I, I described to, to you guys last week how the fees on layer two tend to get cheaper over time um, for multiple reasons. But one of the reasons is that you can share the load of the fees with kind of like more use, uh, uh, sorry, across more users as there's more transactions and stuff like that. But that's just one part of the fee. There is a fixed fee called the call data that needs to kind of um, be put onto L1 that doesn't get affected by the more users out there. So I, I should have mentioned that last week. I, I just forgot to. I just wanted to keep the the um the example as simple as possible. But the other, uh, uh, the other costs associated with transactions can be uh, spread out across like all the transactions on the network. And as there's more transactions, as there's more throughput, the cost should come down over time up to a certain limit because, it, you know, it, this is the same for every single crypto network, every single blockchain. If the blocks are full, then the fees are going to go up. It's, it's the exact same thing. doesn't matter if it's uh, another layer one or a layer two or a sidechain, whatever you want to call them. It's always the same thing. If the capacity is filled up, then people are going to outbid each other to get into a block. It's it's it, it's exactly the same uh, across every network. This doesn't fundamentally change if you're a layer two or layer one. But what layer two gives us is increased capacity, more bang for our buck because it basically uh, allows us to do the execution off-chain and do the settlement on-chain, which is the long-term roadmap of Ethereum anyway. So we're going down the right path. But if you want more info on this, definitely check out this thread from Chainlink God here. It was a, it was a really great breakdown. Um, he, he does a lot of great threads, especially around Chainlink, but it's great to see him putting one together about, about Arbitrum here. Um, and then DC Investor had an interesting tweet because I had a lot of people asking me this as well. And they, he says, the best way to play the growth of L2s on Ethereum is just to buy ETH. All rollups must pay L1 fees in ETH for security. And each L2 allows the ETH-based economy to continue to grow creating more reserve demand for ETH and more opportunities for collateral use. Uh, easy. So I agree with with DC Investor here. I think, you know, I mean, I saw over the weekend that for an hour or so there or a couple of hours, uh, the Optimism Bridge and the Arbitrum Bridge, I believe, were burning, uh, were, were some of the top burners on the um, ultrasound.money leaderboard for, for, for top burners. And on top of that, uh, Arbitrum is posting batches pretty much like every other minute at this point to layer one, which also burns ETH. I think most of it ends up getting burned, the, the fees that they pay, and they pay two to $300 per batch. So you could say that just from Arbitrum alone, they're burning two to $300 per minute, a minute or two or something worth of ETH, which is pretty cool because that adds up really quickly, right? A minute or two is not very long, not very long time, a lot of minutes in a day, right? Um, but I would also add on here, I put out a tweet earlier today where I said, I mean, you guys know this. Uh, I say this all the time. Like every crypto related project is going to have a token, massive asterisks, except the daily way. I always got to put that down. The daily way is not going to have a token, guys. But I'm talking like, you know, protocols like Arbitrum and Optimism, um, all the other other layer twos that don't have one yet and stuff like that. They're all going to have a token. It's just simple as that. And not just them, but like all the apps that are tokenless, they will. I'm pretty confident about that. I mean, I don't have any special knowledge. Um, they haven't, you know, they, these teams haven't told me if they're having a token or anything like that. But 
I just don't see why they wouldn't, like for a number of reasons. So, but in the meantime, while they don't have a token, ETH is, I mean, the the best bet, I think, in my eyes. I mean, I buy ETH partly because of that reason, but I mean, obviously a lot of other reasons as well. But generally, uh, it's very hard to get exposure right now. I mean, you could... Technically, I mean, Matic is is a great exposure to a scalable uh, Ethereum ecosystem as well. Uh, disclose, I, uh, disclosure, I'm an advisor to Polygon. I'm not trying to get you to buy Matic, but like I'm just thinking through my head about what tokens can you can buy or what things you can buy to get exposure to scaling. And really, I mean, ETH is at the center point of everything. And not just because ETH is being used to pay fees and kind of like these layer two still pay fees to layer one but ETH is like the preferred use of as as collateral within these layer twos just as it is on layer one it is used as a fee token on these layer twos as well so it's just extra demand for ETH at the end of the day uh so I think ETH Matic I mean there's probably a few other tokens out there that are kind of like sort of related I guess the seller network token because they've got the seller bridge um that might be something I'm not telling you to go buy these things I'm just running through the ones that come to my head about how to get exposure to I guess like the scaling bridge ecosystem on Ethereum. And there's not many plays right now, but there will be in the future. I mean, ZK Sync already announced that they're going to do a token. That's not a secret. They, that's public knowledge. Um, Starkware, Optimism, Arbitrum, I expect them to do tokens. Uh, I just, you know, it's sometime in the future. I don't know when it's going to be. And I said that you should basically position yourself for an airdrop. I mean, the simplest way to position yourself for these airdrops is just to use the product, uh, the, the the projects. Like if you're on Arbitrum, just use Arbitrum, use Optimism, use Starkware. And the way you use Starkware is you use the apps built on StarkX, like Diversify, Immutable X, um, DYDX, all that sort of stuff. I'm sure they will take that into consideration if they did an airdrop. It's not even a guarantee that they do an airdrop, but I'm sure that they would. Um, so if you yeah, if you want to be best positioned there, that's something to, to kind of do. But at the same time, while you wait for those kind of tokens to come to market, you can always just, I guess, like, buy ETH if you want exposure. I think that, that you can't go wrong with ETH, really. I mean, not just for that, but just for many other reasons. At the, at the end of the day, like you guys know I'm in the trenches with you buying ETH every day, no matter what the price is. Uh, I, I am, you know, trying to stack as much gray as I can because long-term, I, you know, ETH is probably, ETH to me is the, the, the best risk-adjusted investment in the space. All right, so the MakerDAO growth team put out a tweet thread saying that DAI is almost ready to jump into Arbitrum here. So the Maker Protocol Engineering Unit are working to connect DAI to Arbitrum's roll-up solution. Um, they will conduct a final audit of the custom DAI gateway before launch. So essentially this thread goes through like what Arbitrum is and how it all works and everything like that and kind of like how DAI is coming to it here. This is really cool because the way... Maker seems to be approaching getting DAI onto, I guess, uh, uh, layer twos, and they spoke about this with Optimism as well, is that they're creating these custom kind of like gateways in order to make sure that the DAI supply is consistent across all these different kind of layer twos and networks and things like that. Um, and also if they launch on, uh, or when they launch, not if, when they launch on these layer twos, the, the supply can be consistent across the layer two and the layer one networks as well. So it makes a lot of sense to do that, and they seem to be coming to Arbitrum soon um and i'm sure they're going to be launching on optimism soon if not if not uh they haven't already i'm not sure if they have or haven't already i mean there's too much going on in the layer two space to keep up with right now um and on i guess like this is probably the last thing about arbitrum uh, Ryan Sean Adams put out a tweet that Bankless has posted a guide called um, uh, the, what is it? A guide to Arbitrum, essentially, or the essential guide to Arbitrum here. So this guide was written by Ben Jov. Uh, hopefully, hopefully I said your surname right, Ben, who's a Bankless writer uh, and the chair, uh, and the president of Chatman Crypto. So essentially, if you don't know where to get started, if you don't know anything about Arbitrum, you, you know, you're listening to me talk about it and telling you how great it is, you can go check out this thread. It'll give you a full breakdown of how to get in, how to bridge what to use, what to do, everything like that. So this will, of course, be linked in the YouTube description below. I'm glad this is available because at the end of the day, it's easy enough for me to say, oh yeah, Arbitrum's awesome, just bridge in and do whatever. But like, people need to be pointed of what to do. I can't just say do whatever. You need to actually know what to do or what you want to do on there. Obviously, the, the, the kind of like, uh, the simplest things that is, is, is kind of like using Uniswap, using SushiSwap, but there are a bunch of other stuff on a bunch of other things on there. And of course, you can go to portal.arbitrum um, to, to, to kind of like check out what's what's on there. I can't remember exactly what the extension is for that website. There's portal.arbitrum.something. Um, uh, and you can kind of like check out there. I think it's .io or something like that. And you can check out what's live and what's coming on there as well to see what you can, what you can do. 
So Arbitrum is in the only layer to uh, kind of, I guess, making waves over the last week. And I know this isn't really much, but Optimism put out a tweet that said, uh, sorry, can't resist the pre-announcement announcement. Big news dropping next week. Get so hype. So next week being this week, uh, there was a bit of kind of like theorizing about what this announcement would be in the Daily Gray Discord. I said that I think they're going to remove their whitelist. So if you remember, Optimism still has a whitelisting process, whereas Arbitrum doesn't. Uh, that So I think that because of the fact that Arbitrum doesn't have a whitelisting process, uh, they've been able to get all that growth because of, of people just permissionlessly launching whatever they wanted on there and optimism seems to be a bit stifled by this because they have to manually approve kind of projects to launch and all that sort of stuff so i'm hoping that it is a whitelist removal um some people said oh maybe it's a token i don't think they're going to do a token now like <laughs> it's just way too early for that it doesn't really make sense especially when there's no kind of i guess uh, when there's still a whitelist um I don't think, don't think they would make a big deal out of the announcement of kind of increasing the capacity of Optimism. They didn't make a big deal out of it last time. So my money's on them removing the whitelist, to be honest. Um, but there might be a chance that they actually announce uh, some significant cost savings as well because they tease that. And I don't know, there's a, there's a number of different ways this can go, but I really want to see the whitelist removed. Maybe they do multiple announcements. Uh, that'd be cool. But generally, I would really like to see the whitelist removed because at the moment, Optimism is hamstringing themselves by having a whitelist because they're just letting Arbitrum eat their lunch. And that is their main competitor at the end of the day. These are the two leading optimistic roll-up networks. And um, uh, they, they really do. Need, Optimism really does need to catch up here by removing that whitelist. So, We'll see. We'll see what this announcement is uh, this week. Um, and just another thing about Optimism. So Lyra, which is a uh, Optimism native um, options protocol, announced that they're doing a trial liquidity mining program where they're going to distribute 750,000 Lyra tokens starting at 12 a.m. UTC on the 13th of September, which it may have started by the time you watch this. It's probably already started. I don't know what the UTC time is right now. Um, and this is the first chance for the community to earn Lyra and an exclusive opportunity to access the token pre-launch. So you can read the, the full details here. Uh, disclosure, I um, I hold LDR, uh, LDR. I hold Lyra tokens here. I participated in their kind of like treasury diversification kind of thing there. Um, but I participated because I'm really excited about options on layer two uh and you know as i said lyra is an uh optimistic uh ethereum native protocol so it never launched on layer one it launched straight on layer two and it spun out of synthetics and it leverages synthetics to um to kind of like uh, to, 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 to do the trading of, of different options and stuff like that. But also as part of like the liquidity, I guess, mining program here, you can see that you'll be able to uh, provide liquidity to the Uniswap SUSD DAI pool and earn uh, Lyra tokens and do a bunch of other things as well. But that's all detailed in this kind of um, uh, blog post here. So definitely go check that out if you haven't already. Um, and speaking of, I guess, like scaling Ethereum, uh, Polygon is something that I don't see people talking about too much lately, but he's still growing and he's still kind of like very, very active. Now I get why, you know, these things come in waves. One week people will be talking about one solution. The next week they'll be talking about another one. I mean, it's funny just looking over the past two to three weeks, the different kind of narratives that have been struck. Like there was uh, people talking about like uh, Avalanche and then like Solana and then like Phantom. And then it was like, Arbitrum and then uh, I mean before that it was like Polygon and Optimism I mean it's just funny how like week to week and not even week to week like day to day these narratives can just shift so fast and you'll just see like crypto Twitter just talking about different things um, and it's just hilarious how fast the narrative changed from I think it was Solana last week at least earlier on in the week and then Arbitrum started getting a lot of growth and everyone's like oh my god Arbitrum I'm gonna go bridge into Arbitrum now I'm gonna go do this and then Arbitrum kind of took over the narrative and and then I think like the price of of um, of, uh, of kind of like um, some of these uh, these other layer one networks went down so people were kind of like eh, you know I, I'm not you know I don't want to play with you anymore so it's just kind of like funny and I mean, speaking of Poly I do want to speak about the kind of like why that happens. But first, I just want to cover what I want to talk about with Polygon. Essentially, you can see here that the POS chain, um, which is technically not a layer two, right? But, the, you know, you can see here that they're still experiencing some really great growth. You can see that the new, new uh, sorry, unique address growth is still climbing. I mean, it hasn't really slowed down at all. It hasn't really plateaued. It's almost at 60 million unique addresses. And I mentioned before how Arbitrum has um, just 70,000 right now. So you can see the difference between these, like 60 million compared to 70,000. And you can see the growth just came from like April and May for, for Polygon. So I'm expecting that same kind of growth for Arbitrum and Optimism and all the layer two networks. But it's really cool to see that Polygon really paved the way here and we're, we're pioneers on the Ethereum scaling front. And you can see the active addresses um 
uh, the, the, sorry, the active Polygon POS chain addresses hasn't gone down at all. It keeps climbing. Look at this. I mean, they, they peaked at what, 200,000 active addresses and they're at 175,000, but the trend is up. Like, it's not like it's going down. And these aren't just total addresses. These are actively on the network every day uh, doing things on, on Polygon, which I think is, is, is pretty awesome. So it's great to see that uh, essentially this is what all these networks are going to look like, I think. And, you know, going back to what I was saying before about, I guess, kind of the changing narratives, I've written about this a lot and I talked about this a lot, but I think the number one thing most people suffer from in crypto is something called recency bias, which I think I've explained before, but essentially it's it's this kind of like bias where you uh, put more weight on recent events. And then by doing so, you basically kind of, I guess, trick yourself into believing that like the past week's worth of events uh, uh, basically applies to like a year's worth of development or events that happen, which is, which is, stupid right it's dumb it doesn't like it doesn't make any sense because if you just look at like uh the ecosystem as like one week of activity well then of course you're going to be like oh my god like ethereum's dead like this pl platform's taking over because everyone's talking about it but that's not the truth at all what's and what ends up happening is that you hear about one topic for a week and then the the whole kind of like narrative and, not, and everyone just uh, changes. Everyone just gets bored of it. Like the, the clearest example of this is think to like the beginning of this year, I think, or maybe like uh, beginning to mid of this year when BSC started kind of getting a lot of attention and taking off and things like that. And, and kind of like it was, it was um, taking advantage of Ethereum's high gas fees, which all of these networks do, by the way. But anyway. Um, they were kind of taking advantage of it and like, everyone was talking about it for a week or two. Then it went dead silent and you didn't hear anyone talking about it anymore. And it's not that doesn't mean that the network has kind of like collapsed in activity. It still has a, a fair bit of activity on there and everything. But it's just hilarious how it was literally all anyone could talk about for like one or two weeks. And then I don't see anyone talk about it at all anymore. Quite literally, I see people talking about Ethereum competitors all the time and no one on my feed is talking about BSC anymore. It's always talking about some of these other new networks like Solana, Avalanche, or Phantom sometimes, or whatever. Uh, it's never about BSC anymore. So in a few months, we're probably not even going to hear about these other ones anymore. And, you know, we might not even hear about uh, some of the layer twos or whatever. Like Polygon, for example, doesn't really get much spotlight at the moment because they got a lot early on and now people are kind of like used to it. Like, okay, well, you know, Polygon's still growing. It's still good and I'm still using it. But like, why would you talk about it when it's not new and fresh? So this is exactly what happens with a lot of this sort of stuff. And it's why uh, it can get, it can be very hard to trade these markets too because you might be chasing a narrative. And by the time everyone's talking about something, I mean, the way I play it, and this is an investment advice, but the way I play it, when everyone's talking about something, it's a really bad idea to jump into uh, like an investment, right? We, we saw this play out over the last week, particularly with Solana, where everyone on my feed was talking about it, whether they were shitting on it, whether they were complimenting it, whatever. And then a day later, the price collapsed. I mean, it went from like 210, I think, to 150 or, or whatever it is now, 160. Um, so obviously like you don't want to be jumping into something that's like extremely crowded and everyone's talking about it and everyone's trying to shill everything. It's just amazing. And the same happened with, 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 um, I think like a lot of these networks like BSC with BNB, Polygon with Matic, it always happens the same way where everyone's talking about something and everyone's kind of like shilling it like it's the best thing ever. And it's happened in a really short amount of time. Then what ends up happening is that the prices end up getting way ahead of themselves and collapsing because what, okay. So what ends up happening with, with, with the way the crypto markets work is that, You'll see things increase in price a lot, but there's two things that happen when, when things increase in price. One, it causes you to FOMO, but two, uh, you know, FOMO, because, especially if you're a newer, newer uh, kind of like investor, and two, it everyone else who bought in before is now sending on profits. So what do you think is going to happen if the price just accelerates and the price just keeps going up? The people who are sitting on profits are going to start taking profits, which means that no no longer do you need um, just, just the money to push the price up from the usual kind of day-to-day -day sellers. You need even more money to push the price up to get to... to um, uh, I, I guess like uh, survive the onslaught of all these people that are massively in profit. And then on top of that, you have a third thing, which is that when traders see something going up really, really quickly and have, has been doing it for, for a little while, at least like say a couple weeks, something, they're going to start opening shorts. So now you are contending with a lot of shorts being opened because the, these um, shorters are expecting the price to fall because all these people are going to take profits. And that's why you can, can, you can see fast collapses of these kind of things. And actually, during the, the the big crash where ETH went from 4K to 3K, I think some of these other platforms that have been pumping a lot, especially Solana, I, I mentioned Solana a lot because that's the one that I've heard about a lot, and that's just a good example. I think it went from like, you know, 200, 170 actually to like 110 or something like that, then back up 270 to 210, then came back down. It was just like super, super volatile. Um, 
but it just becomes harder and harder because when people are sitting on massive profits, they're going to start taking them. And and the thing is, is that you want more gradual kind of long-term slow growth than fast growth. Like if, if ETH was to double it this week, if ETH went from 3K to 6K this week, it's not going to stay there for very long. It's going to da- it's going to uh, correct very, very hard because what ends up happening is that everyone who bought at 3K, all the traders, they're going to be like, holy shit, I just made double my money in a week. Of course, I'm going to take profits here. And then all the people who bought, a lot of the people who bought earlier who are like, oh my God, I'm sitting on so much profit are going to take profit. And then you've got the shorts on top of that. And then you've got like the, and then you've got the greedy longs, I should say too, that are longing and, and, and people, and then they're going to get liquidated. And then you get liquidation cascade happening. It's just, it's so dangerous. And this is why you see such reflexivity in crypto, especially on the shorter time frames. And it's why people always say, focus on the long term and don't, don't trade. I mean, you can trade if you want to. As I said, I've been doing a little bit a little bit of trading on DYDX lately, but really, I mean, that's with play money. I'm not using big money or anything like that. I'm not trying to, to make big money. I'm just doing it for fun because I wanted to try out the DYDX platform. Uh, but generally, trading is just stupidly hard, guys. Like so, And that falls into, uh, and, and being a good trader means you have to remove a lot of biases from you as well. Like recency bias, as I said, is one of the worst, especially in crypto, especially if you're sitting on crypto Twitter. I think actually sitting on crypto Twitter, unless you know how to get rid of your biases, is probably really bad for you as a trader. Um, but anyway, none of that is investment advice, just a bit of kind of, I guess, color around the changing narratives within crypto and how I kind of view them and how I kind of tend to ignore them. Like you may have seen a lot of different people kind of like talking about different kind of Ethereum competitors over the last few weeks. Uh, I've given my comments here and there and I talk you know, somewhat about it on the refill because people ask me to. But generally, whenever I see this stuff happening, I, th- I always remind myself, I'm like, Anthony, you've seen this happen so many times before. And I, I, tell, I tell my friends this as well. I'm like, guys, like calm down. Like remember how much people talked about X, um, X chain or, or, or Y chain or Z chain? What do you hear about them anymore? No. So stop kind of like letting your, your bias get the best of you. Stop letting this recency bias infect your brain and start looking at the bigger picture because that's the only way, at least I, I believe it's the only way to win long-term in this market is to look at the long-term. And really the long-term is that Ethereum is stronger than ever. Ethereum is actually scaling now. We have these layer two networks live. It's it's just totally amazing what's been happening. And, you know, there's been lots of kind of like stuff going on on the research and development side, lots of things live. And this is really only the beginning of Ethereum scaling kind of journey as well. There's still plenty of optimizations and improvements to come. The end goal, you know, a lot of people agree that the end goal probably is just ZK rollups. And there's a lot of good content out there about them right now and about how we can get them doing smart contracts, how we can basically get it so that, the transactions are extremely cheap by using validiums or, vo- or volitions or other su- or other such constructions and stuff like that. So yeah, I mean, guys, the future is bright. I, I kind of like felt like I had to talk about that because I had a lot of people asking me about different networks and things like that. Feel free to play with them and try them out and, and you know, research them and see what their trade-offs are, see how they achieve extra scale, blah, 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 or what features they offer that Ethereum maybe doesn't. But at the end of the day, I think that if you get caught in the short-term stuff, uh, it's not a very good trading strategy or investment strategy. At least that's my kind of like view on things. Uh, but anyway, I'm going to leave it at that for now. I've got a couple of more things to get through before I wrap today's episode up. So uh, Sina uh, Habiba, Habibian, hopefully I said that right, uh, has started a new podcast where they'll be hosting conversations around the ideas shaping crypto. The first episode here is with Vitalik Buterin and Carl Floesch, uh, where they talk about retroactive public goods funding. I haven't listened to this yet because it just came out like an hour or two ago. I plan to listen to this probably tomorrow while I'm playing some games. <laughs> I usually like listening to podcasts while I'm playing a little bit of World of Warcraft. It's funny because um, I don't really play it for very long. I play it for like an hour or so. And it's not like I'm playing it and getting like tons of fun out of it. I just need something. I, my, I don't know. The way I work is like I need to be doing something when I'm listening to a podcast. Either like that's me riding my bike or that's me playing like a game where I can listen to a podcast or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's what I plan. That's when I plan to listen to it. But I, I, I guess like I, I recommend you guys listening to this as well. Vitalik obviously is a great um, kind of like uh, a great person to hear from. And Carl as well. I mean, Carl works for, at, at, uh, at Optimism, has been working on Ethereum and kind of like scaling stuff for a very long time now. Uh, and he's just an all around great dude. I'm sure a lot of you would have seen him recently on the Bankless podcast where they kind of um, uh, interviewed him and Ben from Optimism. So definitely go check out this podcast as well. 
Another thing to check out is this amazing blog post from Pauline Yar here, who is uh, a liberosist on, um, on Reddit. I spoke about him last week, I believe. So in this blog post, he addresses the common misconceptions around roll-ups. And I mean, this is awesome. Like I, I actually highly recommend reading this more than pretty much like uh, most things in crypto. I think this does a really, really great job of just simply breaking down what these misconceptions are, why they're wrong, what, you know, what the actual explanation is, um, and kind of like just gives like a, a, a nice objective lens on these sorts of things. So definitely recommend going and checking this out. Uh, and the last thing here is that Ethereum.org has added a new play, a new page explaining Ethereum governance. So basically, a lot of people have asked me about Ethereum governance before, especially on the AMAs, how it works, what's the process, what goes on with it. On this page, you can basically see all that. Uh, and you could actually contribute to editing it as well if you want, because uh, Ethereum.org is fully open source. But you can see here, you know, who's involved, what's an EIP, what's the process look like, what's the... Um, how, how do we handle disagreements and gives the DAO fork as an example, uh, how the beacon chain works, how do you can get involved, all that sort of stuff. So yeah, go check out this new web page. It'll be linked in the YouTube description, of course. But I think that's going to be it for today, everyone. So thank you again for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks, everyone.